Okay. The next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 15116 in the name of Christian Arar on the impact of UK immigration bill on Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I invite those members who wish to take part in this debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And uh, Mr Allard, if you are ready, I would be grateful if you would open the debate. I would further invite members who are leaving the chamber to do so quickly and quietly, and also indeed members of the public, if they would be kind enough to also leave the chamber quickly and quietly, please. Mr Allard. Merci. President the officer, this motion has received cross-party support because we, in this chamber, in the public gallery and across Scotland, do not agree with the passage of the UK government's immigration bill. The reason is simple. This so-called reserved matter will have a devastating impact on devolved areas of responsibility. Let me quote from another cross-party document, the Smith Commission report. It says, the parties have agreed that the Scottish and UK governments should work together to explore the possibility of different powers being in place in Scotland for asylum seekers to access accommodation and financial support and advice. How far back does this immigration bill take us from the spirit and the letter of the Smith Commission report? I will tell you, President Officer, back to the 1950s, there's changes on employment extending powers to immigration officers, along with the changes on housing and on asylum decision appeals, all reflect the intention of Westminster to further discriminate people like me, the people who choose to come to live here. The implementation of this bill will truly bring back institutionalized racism. When I first drafted this motion, I did think that the bill was in danger of driving people further into the hands of unscrupulous employers, risking deepening exploitation. Let me amend this part of the motion, presenting officer. I know the employers in the North East and across Scotland. The number of unscrupulous employers will not increase. What will increase is the number of employers who will become reluctant to employ anyone who are appearing to be foreign, foreign, bringing institutionalized racism to the place of work. From the Law Society of Scotland briefing for this debate, and I'd like to thank them for the information, Clause 9, offence of employing illegal worker. Clause 9 appears to empower immigration officers to arrest persons without warrant who are not subject to immigration control and who may be British citizen, and we have reasonable grounds for suspecting we are committing the offence of employing illegal workers. I agree with the Law Society of Scotland and the Immigration Law Practitioners Association. Employers will be reluctant to employ anyone who does not hold a, a British passport. And a British passport, I can remind the chamber, can cost 70 to 50 to 85 pounds 50, and it can take up to six weeks uh, to be delivered. So. Uh, it, will, it will really uh, 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 make employers return to employ all these people with, with or without British pipes, and, and they will regard them as not looking or sounding British or even having a British name. As for the new powers to allow immigration officers to search licensed premises without any need for a, a subscription for an immigration offence is being committed, this is about licenses law, a devolved matter. This Parliament. This Scottish Government and this Minister today have to be clear, the UK Government must not be allowed to legislate in devolved matters without our consent. While this Parliament's Equal Opportunities Committee is conducting an inquiry into race, ethnicity and employment, to see what measures can be taken to achieve positive outcomes in employment in today's 21st century Scotland. While we do this here, Westminster is attempting to take back all of the UK to the 1950s years of discrimination and institutionalized racism. 
Just like employers, landlords will be put in a very difficult position too. When asked to do the work of immigration officers, knowing that landlords can face fines of up to £3,000 if they fail to inspect tenants' passports and other identity documents to establish that they are not legally here, will only have one consequence. The consequence, President Officer, that this bill will deter landlords to let accommodation to anyone appearing to be foreign, bringing institutional racism to housing. The Scottish Government Minister for Housing said that this legislation risks driving vulnerable migrants to rent from landlords who are happy to flout the law. I think landlords in Scotland will just choose not to rent to anyone looking or sounding foreign. I agree with our Minister, Margaret Vargas, when she said private individuals or businesses uh, should not take on the role of the Home Office and Border Agency. Let me quote as well Shelter Scotland on that matter, and I thank them for their support and briefing. We share the very serious concern of the Scottish Refugee Council, they said, and others about the legislative approach the UK government are taking with the immigration bill. And what they say particularly is their concern of the implication for Scotland's law on both tenancy and homelessness. Shelter Scotland had it that they strongly believe, like of us, that the Scottish Parliament should be accorded legislative consent and the time to scrutinise the aspects of this bill that relate to devolved powers. Consultation, committee scrutiny, and a full debate with a vote at the end. Nothing less, presiding officer. On asylum decision appeals, I'm appalled. Appalled, presiding officer. But when the rest of Europe is responding to the biggest refugee crisis since World War II, the UK government wants to remove in-country rights of appeal against Home Office immigration decision, which will result in more families being split up, adding to the crisis instead of supporting the very desperate people reaching our shores. Last October, Stuart MacDonald, MP, the shadow SNP a spokesperson on immigration, asylum and border control, described the bill as regressive, illiberal, ill-considered and inhumane. From another briefing, presenting officer from the Scottish Refugee Council, removal of this right to appeal is simply egregious, not only in terms of its serious impact on those affected, but also in terms of facilitating state-sanctioned destitution in rule of law terms, as it extinguishes the right to effective remedies in Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights. And the Scottish Refugee Control, I've got a lot of words about the bill. I'll have no time to use all these words, but some of them are driven by ideology based on supposition lacking any credible evidence base. But you can look at it. Uh, uh, we are not the only one. A lot of organizations out there pushing very, very hard against this bill. Uh, they added that it was, I quote, possibly unlawful in neglecting, in neglecting uh, child welfare and removal of appeal rights against destitution. And of course, they agree with all the other legal briefing we received for this debate. Uh, this bill is breaching our devolved settlement. To conclude, President Officer, we have been asked today to unite, to unite and to stop any extension or application of this legislation to Scotland without the consent of this Parliament. I am an immigrant, proud to be one of the many new Scots contributing to modern Scotland. Institutionalised racism to this country of ours cannot come back to us. President Officer. Thank you very much. <laughs> now call on Ken McIntosh to be followed by Jimmy McGregor. Presenting officer, and can I begin by thanking Christian Allard for bringing forward uh, today's debate, and I'd like to echo uh, many of the sentiments that he's expressed uh, this afternoon. The Conservative government's proposed immigration bill is an important and unhelpfully uh, controversial measure. Uh, I'm pretty sure the vast majority of MSPs in the Scottish Parliament will have no uh, hesitation in recording our opposition uh, to this bill, and certainly I would uh, do similarly and uh, pledge the, the opposition of my Labour colleagues at Westminster. Uh, in fact, I don't think I could do, put it better than the uh, forceful and powerful statement of concern uh, issued today by a number of organisations and individuals, including the Scottish Refugee Council, uh, Shelter and Homeless Action Scotland, in which they described provisions in the bill as self-defeating, deeply harmful and provisions which will facilitate great suffering on already vulnerable uh, women, children 
and men. The bill will be damaging to our communities, damaging to immigrants themselves, damaging to the way we support children and families, and damaging to those of us who want to live in an inclusive, tolerant and compassionate country. Now, those are the substantive reasons we should resist this bill, and we will be doing so uh, both here and at Westminster. But what I want to focus on in terms of this afternoon's debate is the impact the bill will have on several areas of devolved responsibility, and yet the worrying lack of clarity around its scrutiny, accountability or governance arrangements. At the heart of my concerns is the proposal to effectively outsource the enforcement of immigration policy and to involve others, a series of private individuals from driving instructors and bank staff to landlords. Now, as you might imagine, presenting officer, I believe most public services are best delivered by public servants with the appropriate mechanisms in place for democratic accountability and scrutiny. In this case, looking at the proposals for landlords in particular, they place a duty on private citizens or private businesses, as well as local authorities and housing association landlords, to inspect citizenship and immigration documents for new tenants and require them to conduct checks on existing residents. Now, many of us as MSPs will have dealt with immigration cases, and we know that this is already a highly complicated and bureaucratically complex process, and there must be a huge risk to all those involved of going down such a path, not least of which is the potential harm done to people already in a highly vulnerable situation. There are, I believe, around uh, 380 families living here who would face an immediate challenge, but there are around 330,000 people living in private rented accommodation in Scotland who could also potentially be affected. The bill introduces a new right of eviction, not accessed or overseen by our courts in the Scottish legal system, but with authority stemming directly from the Home Office. It's not just the, the confident sapping fact that around 30% of Home Office decisions on asylum claims are overturned on appeal that worries me. It's the introduction of new procedures to our private rented sector, just as we are debating this very afternoon, how to make private tenure more stable and more secure. The regulations governing these procedures will be drawn up under what uh, is often termed Henry VIII powers by the UK government. In other words, wide-ranging executive powers not subject to scrutiny by the Delegated Powers Committee or, for that matter, of any other committee in this Parliament, powers which could include repealing existing provisions within acts of the Scottish Parliament. There is so much to worry about here and why the full impact of this law needs to be examined in greater detail. We know that some migrants to this country are trafficked here and used for forced labour or even sexual exploitation. This bill could effectively give the traffickers more control over their victims through limiting their access to accommodation. The bill amends the already horrendously complex support regime for refused asylum-seeking families and children. It's forecast to leave many parents and children destitute. Now, leaving aside our feelings in the matter at this abhorrent uh, proposal, this is something that is incompatible with our duty on human rights and will therefore potentially leave the legislation open to challenge in the Scottish and UK courts. In fact, there's also every reason to expect landlords to respond to this bill by simply not taking on tenants from migrant populations. This would be hugely discriminatory against an already vulnerable group of people, which by itself, of course, would again leave the legislation open to challenge on grounds of its discriminatory impact. Presenting officer, I want this bill to be withdrawn or defeated but at the very least, here in the Scottish Parliament, we need to ensure clarity and good governance. This is not the only bill where legislation which is reserved to Westminster overlaps with responsibilities devolved to Holyrood. And we need to establish sound procedures to scrutinise such measures and to ensure proper accountability. It may be that this duty is being carried out at Westminster, but if so, I would expect to hear the UK Minister's justification why that is so and why there is no need for a legislative consent motion in this case. At the very least, can I suggest that the Parliament refers this bill to the Devolution Further Powers Committee uh, to investigate further, uh, convened by my colleague Bruce Crawford across there. Presenting officer, it would be very easy to simply rail against everything coming from Westminster and pretend everyone in Scotland was liberally minded. I don't kid myself that's the case, but we have a duty to make sure we carry out our duties and responsibilities as a legislator properly. Thank you. Thanks so much. <coughs> I now call on Jamie McGregor to be followed by Sandra White. Uh, thank, <clears throat> thank you, presiding officer. I'm pleased to speak in today's debate, but members will not be surprised to hear that I simply do not recognise much of the characterisation of the UK government's immigration bill as set out in Christian Allard's motion and speech today. Um, I, I respect the member, but I think he's talking nonsense. The UK government was elected 
with an overall majority in last year's general election on a very strong platform of reforming our immigration laws and putting right an immigration system that was left in chaos by the previous government. It has a clear mandate for this legislation, which is part of its efforts to get a grip of the immigration system, something that has widespread public support across the UK, including Scotland. Um, and may I say also a great deal of support across the rest of Europe. The immigration bill has three clear aims. To tackle illegal working and labor market abuses, to ensure that only migrants who are lawfully present in the UK can access services such as the ability to drive on our roads and use UK bank accounts, and to make it easier to remove illegal immigrants from the, migrants from the UK, and all of us surely would support these objectives. No, I won't. You've had your go. At the, um, I won't. I'm going to make some progress here. All of us will, I'm confident, also agree that migrant workers are particularly vulnerable to labor, labor market exploitation and may find themselves living and working in dangerous and degrading conditions. And we need to accept that labor market exploitation is an increasingly organized criminal activity which is fueling illegal immigration. Government regulators that enforce workers' rights need reform and better coordination to tackle this problem. The creation of a new statutory director of labor market enforcement to provide a central hub of intelligence and facilitate the allocation of resources across the different regulators is therefore surely welcome. It has already been welcomed by, Lado, by Labour's Shadow Home Secretary and Andy Burnham MP. The bill also makes it easier to bring prosecutions against employers where they knowingly employ illegal workers and to enable the earnings of illegal workers to be seized under proceeds of crime legislation. Powers will also be granted to immigration officers to close business premises for up to 48 hours or even longer in certain cases where the employer has previously been given a civil penalty or has been prosecuted for employing illegal workers. Immigration officers and police will also have the power, a new power to search for and seize UK driving licenses which are in the possession of a person who is not lawfully in the UK. And banks and building societies will have to perform periodic checks and notify the Home Office where a person disqualified from holding a current account by reason of their immigration status is identified. And in terms of private rented accommodation, the bill creates four offences to target those rogue landlords and agents who deliberately and repeatedly fail to comply with the right to rent scheme or fail to evict individuals who they know or have reasonable cause to believe are disqualified from renting as a result of their immigration status. To conclude, presiding officer, I recognize that getting an immigration system that is fair, efficient, fit for purpose is a big challenge, not just for the UK, but for every Western democracy, as we face severe international disputes which are pushing up migrant numbers and as we deal with organized crime and international human trafficking gangs. The immigration bill is part of the UK government's work towards this, and its proportionate and practical measures do have my support. And I would urge the Scottish government to continue to engage fully with the UK government on this subject, as many of the fundamental aims are, I believe, shared by both governments and by people across Scotland and the rest of the UK. Thank you very much. Thank you. We now call on Sandra White to be followed by Hansana Malik. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And can I congratulate Christian Allard on securing this very important and also timely debate? Uh, President Officer, I'll probably reiterate what Christian Allard uh, said when he mentioned the word appalling. And uh, when you look at uh, what's happening in the world, experience the refugee crisis of great magnitude. Uh, men, women and children fleeing violence, particularly in the Middle East, Sub-Sahara and North Africa, risking their lives to escape war-torn countries and, as we know very well and have seen, uh, unfortunately, reports actually dying in the process of, to get out of these war-torn countries. And what happens? Westminster government's answer to this is to introduce the Immigration Act 2014 and now legislation which will have a direct impact on Scotland's laws and powers of this Parliament, and that's where I differ from Jamie McGregor, and I'll 
point that out to you shortly. Um, the powers of this Parliament are very important to us, to Scotland, and in this particular aspect, to refugees and asylum seekers uh, who come to Scotland, who are welcomed in Scotland uh, to our country. And if I can uh, mention the, Refu the Scottish Refugee Council says that it's breathing, and I thank them very much for that. Legislation in a refugee crisis should be there to protect, not harm, migrants and refugees. And I think that says it all, and certainly not what the Westminster Government has put forward. Uh, presiding officer, and I want to, if Jamie McGregor will listen to this, Jamie McGregor mentioned uh, the Westminster Government having a mandate. Well, the Scottish Parliament has a mandate from the Scottish people, and legislation we put down is absolutely going to be wiped out by this immigration bill, which is coming from Westminster, which does not have a mandate in this parliament and in this country, in particular the, the impact the bill will have on licensing, housing, tenancy law, evictions and the safeguarding of the well-being of children, including those looked after. Now, that's very important to us, and I'm sure it is to you as well, Jamie. They do not have a mandate to interfere in this legislative competence which we in the Scottish Parliament have. Another issue which I do want to raise, and I have an experience of that particular issue, is uh, I think Christian Allard mentioned it as well, is uh, the bill of removal, the first tier appeal. Uh, you know, destitution is practically guaranteed uh, by the bill of removal of the right to appeal to the first tier asylum support. Um, individuals and families, children as, as well, who have their support refused or discontinued uh, at the Home Secretary deems there's no barrier to returning them home. How many times have I heard that when I've been along to appeals and helping to represent people? And as it goes on to say, it really is a vital safeguard uh, you know, against extremely high levels of incorrect, and I've found this, as have others as well, incorrect Home Office decisions on asylum support. Two-thirds of appeals lodged at the tribunals leads to support continuing or being reinstated. And the reason that this appeal is lodged is half the time they do not have the proper information to protect these asylum seekers. And with the help of a good lawyer and the, the institutions and the groups that we work with, well, I can only speak for Glasgow, I'm sure it's throughout Scotland as well, uh, basically we can actually put in that appeal. Uh, have I got time, presiding officer? For you, yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I thank the member for taking the intervention. I just think it, it might be worth, I agree with all that she's saying, and I, I wonder if, if um, in some of the cases that you've dealt with, it's important to recognize that not always uh, in, in every instance is it an immigrant, but often immigrants have married local people. And we, we're in danger in this bill of actually asking somebody to make up their mind whether they're, they're going to leave the country with their immigrant partner or break up a marriage, and often a family. I, I'm absolutely, um, Gina, it's absolutely right. We have had experience of this. In one case, in, 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 which we were represented, uh, the person actually went to Ireland because they discovered that their maternal grandparent uh, was Irish, and they went over with their partner-to-be to Ireland, and they were allowed to marry and become Irish citizens. And that's the law, the, the Dublin uh, law over there. So certainly I absolutely agree with you in that particular part of it. The many of the appeals that, that I've appeared at and, and represented, and I must thank all the organisations, individuals, and uh, the lawyers, Fraser Latter's uh, lawyer in particular, who give a great deal of their time to represent and, and the work they do for these people. And the many uh, ones who have been overturned, Many of them now work and live in Scotland, they have businesses, small businesses, they work within the, the area, and they're great citizens, a great asset to Scotland. They'd have been lost, they'd have been sent back. And in many areas, uh, they probably would have been dead by now if we hadn't fought that appeal. So I'm really concerned about that first stage appeal in that. And uh, in conclusion, presiding officer, I think uh, I saw last night, certainly on the TV and others might have seen it as well, the two young Syri Syrian girls in Clyde Bank who were skating along the corridor. These um, scooters were donated by neighbours. They were so happy. Now, I don't know if I've got this analogy correct, but I think they said that Clyde Bank was paradise. Uh, I don't know if I go as far as saying that, but they certainly said it was paradise. But the one thing you can see in their face Places, with sheer happiness and relief. They were here, they were safe, and there was no more bombs dropping on them. Surely that's what we want to see here in Scotland, not this uh, terrible bill. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. <coughs> now call on Hans Alan Malik, after which we'll move the closing speech to the Minister. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. 
I would like to thank Christian Allard for bringing this matter for debate. The UK government's immigration is a very problematic piece of legislation on many levels. One part, the right to rent scheme, requires landlords to check immigration status documents. In addition, the, the bill gives landlords uh, powers uh, to evict tenants uh, whose right to rent has expired without need to go to, for a court order. If extended to Scotland, this would undermine the current Scottish tenancy laws. At the moment, I believe that the implications for Scotland are unclear and the Scottish Government needs to get clarity in terms of the immigration bill. Landlords are not immigration officers. As for the UK immigration bill, the Conservative Government wants to make landlords and letting agents to be administrators. That should be, done, that should be done by Home Office officials. But due to massive reduction in staff numbers, they want to shift the responsibility to somebody else. Landlords could face, face prison sentences if they get it wrong. And these people are no experts in immigration and should not be expected to carry out such responsibilities and be answerable to the government legislation. Even if you pass the buck on checking people's immigration documents, you will still need staff to enforce the new laws. Without enforcement, passing laws is pretty pointless. In fact, bad legislation and poor enforcement can be more harmful than good. I have been asking for a sensible discussion about immigration for a long time now. There has been a lot of noise made about calls for fresh talent post-study work visas to be brought back in order to supply support the Scottish university sector to attract students from overseas. As I have said in this chamber before, the immigration system is not meant to only help one, one sector of the economy or one part of the country we need an immigration system that will help us manage skills shortages in the UK. Personally, I'm in favor of the point-based system where separate regions of a country can set their own parameters, similar to Canada, for example. But, presiding officer, what is very clear is that whilst we are part of the UK and whilst the UK government has the right to legislate for the UK, there are some powers that have been given to this parliament and this government, and the UK government needs to respect that. The UK government also needs to understand that there are local needs uh, in terms of uh, the student, uh, student portfolio that I've already mentioned, that we desperately need support and help in that area, and the British government has consistently denied us that opportunity. Perhaps they've done it because they feel that it needs to be done UK-wide. But nevertheless, this is something that needs to be done. I think we have across the chamber support for that type of thinking. So this bill needs to be defeated, first of all, in the UK Parliament, I believe. But more importantly, we also need to see how it impl implicates the Scottish legislation. And I'm sure that the, uh, the, the, the Scottish law system will advise the government in how best to tackle that issue. But finally, presiding officer, what I will say is that no law is a good law which hurts the country's economy and it infringes on people's rights. We cannot expect un unprofessionals, untrained people to do a professional job. We cannot expect households, managers, agents, carry out owners and restaurant owners to do the immigration's job for them. I think it's very unreasonable and it's hurting a lot of people throughout the country. Thank you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> we'll now move to the closing speech from the Minister, whom you have seven minutes or thereby. Please, Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. My thanks to Christian Allard for bringing this uh, very important debate uh, to the Scottish Parliament. Thank you to the Chamber for some very thoughtful uh, and very forceful and robust uh, contributions uh, as well. Before I go into the, the substance of the bill and where I think it touches, of course, upon uh, areas devolved to the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government. 
Uh, I want to just look at the bill as a, as a whole for just a second and also make and reiterate the points that some of my colleagues have made. Uh, there seems to be by this UK government, and I would say by successive UK governments, but certainly by this current UK government, an undue focus on irregular migration. Uh, the increased uh, criminalisation of migrants uh, completely ignores the contributions that migrants make to our economy, to our demography, to our society, to our communities and to our culture. There seems to be, I would use this word uh, purposefully, there seems to be an ob obsession with immigrants by the current UK government. Everything seems to be the fault of migration. And sometimes immigrants can be too easy a lightning rod uh, to point to, uh, to, to accuse for all of the faults that we have in our society. The economic faults that we have because we haven't been careful enough with the economy, let's blame the immigrants. Because we haven't brought forward the correct housing legislation, let's blame it on immigrants. Because uh, perhaps uh, uh, problems with education, with the health service, whatever it is, it seems to be, well, let's blame uh, the immigrant for that. That is, uh, that is completely the incorrect uh, approach uh, to take. And of course, it ignores the important point that immigrants have made an incredible contribution to this country. A report by uh, UCL showed that between 2001 and 2011, the contribution by EU migrants uh, alone was 21 billion over that decade. And the report's also showing uh, that non-EU migrants have made a considerable economic contribution to this country over the years and over the decades. Uh, from the Scottish Government's perspective, uh, we of course support a system of sensible managed migration which meets Scotland's need for our economy but also for our society. Alongside our efforts to create more jobs uh, in Scotland and develop the skills of our workforce, we must be able to retain and indeed attract uh, world-class talent to fill vacancies which cannot be filled by resident uh, workers. Uh, we are of the opinion in the Scottish Government. Yes, of course. I'll take that. Mean, I, I, th I thank the Minister very much for taking the invitation. Um, I, I appreciate Sandra White's point about the, uh, the two girls on television last night. And I was delighted also to see them calling Cloudbank paradise. And I would agree that compared to what they had come from, it certainly is paradise. But I would also say that Kofi Annan was on the same television and praised the UK government for taking uh, refugees straight from the camps surrounding Syria and flying them to this country rather than um, try, to try and stop them from crossing Europe and, and the dangerous Mediterranean where 30,000 have been drowned over the last 15 years. Would he agree that that is a good thing? Mr. I've never uh, disagreed with the UK government taking uh, any number of refugees. Of course, they had to uh, begrudgingly be forced into that position to do it from the public pressure and pressure from other stakeholders to do so. But I welcomed it when it came. But I think it would be foolish to say that you can only uh, take uh, migrants or I should say refugees uh, from the refugee camps in neighbouring Syria. Uh, and you can just turn a blind eye to all those who are crossing over the Aegean Sea, many of them, of course, drowning, many of them losing family members in that drown uh, crossing and simply ignore the fact that refugees are coming to Europe and let's just leave Europe to deal with it. I think we have a moral obligation, so I would disagree uh, on that point. But back to the, the, the immigration bill uh, at hand. Uh, many of the proposals, uh, we believe, of course, touch upon devolved responsibilities. The Scottish Government Minister, Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Alex Neil, has written to the UK Government four times uh, to seek clarification and put on concern uh, some of our, uh, put, put on record some of our concerns around the immigration bill. I think Ken McIntosh spoke very powerfully about uh, the, the housing issue, as did many other uh, members, and just to touch upon that, uh, it would be of great concern to us uh, that private landlords, uh, citizens who own property, are effectively being used to plug the gaps of government departments uh, doing the job that uh, home, office, home office officials uh, should be doing. I note that many, uh, not only will this have a, a direct impact on, 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 on migrants uh, who are here, many of them, of course, uh, most of them, I should say, vast majority of them who are here legally. But actually, it will also uh, have some effect on UK citizens uh, as well. There was, uh, uh, may I have heard Labour MPs speak powerfully about this. I heard some third sector organisations speak about this. That even those who have uh, what you might consider a foreign sounding name may well be discriminated against by landlords who may just think, well, actually, I just don't want the half. So even though those people may well be uh, UK citizens. So at the, uh, in terms of... Uh, our own uh, concerns as the Scottish Government uh, presiding officer will continue to make those uh, forcefully. We believe that uh, 
uh, anything the UK Government does on the immigration bill uh, should be with the consultation not just of the Scottish Government, as important as that is, but also with Scottish stakeholders uh, right across uh, the board. In terms of asylum, many uh, of my colleagues across the Chamber spoke about uh, the asylum. I, I noted uh, Jamie McGregor's uh, statement. He said everybody wants an immigration system and an asylum system that is fair. Uh, and I would agree with that. Of course we do. Uh, but I would say that the current asylum system isn't fair. I would say that having uh, pre-dawn uh, uh, dawn, dawn uh, raids is, is not fair. I would say uh, detention of uh, not only adults but also of children uh, down south is not fair. I would say making asylum seekers, uh, giving them a plastic card with £35 a week, dehumanising them uh, in that regard is not fair. I would say not allowing asylum seekers the right to work uh, is not fair. So I don't think we have a fair system. If anything, this immigration bill will make the situation more difficult, will make it more unfair uh, for asylum seekers uh, and those uh, looking uh, to, to make a life here in Scotland and, of course, across the United Kingdom. Uh, so I don't think that the purpose of the bill is to improve the lives of immigrants. I, I don't see that uh, as being uh, the case. Uh, I uh, agree with what Sandra White said and uh, others have said about destitution. I think this bill will make destitution more likely. Uh, I was at the Scottish Refugee Council, AGM, uh, last week, along with Kezia Dugdale, and uh, many of the third sector organisations there spoke to me about what can the Scottish Government do to, to help uh, those who will be made even uh, who will be more, made destitute because of this bill, and I'm give a, a, an open commitment to meet with them uh, to discuss that. But in conclusion, it's clear to me, uh, and it's been confirmed by members' contributions today, that the immigration bill uh, does not meet the needs of Scotland. There's nothing uh, to protect vulnerable individuals who need that help. Uh, in fact, this bill will create a more hostile environment uh, for the vulnerable uh, and those without legal status, and the many British citizens who will be subject to the wide-ranging powers of the bill. Uh, we will continue to make the uh, case to the UK Government that uh, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament must be consulted in those areas, in many areas of devolved responsibilities. But I thank the member, members for very insightful contributions today and assure them that the Scottish Government will continue to oppose the damaging, damaging measures within this bill. Many thanks. Thank you all for taking part in this important debate. And I now suspend this meeting until 2.30.